Okay, it is noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to University of Illinois Extension's local government education program. Uh, my name is Zach Kennedy and I'm an Extension Specialist in Community and Economic Development with um, U of I Extension. For sound quality, we will mute all the microphones during the presentation. Um, you can use the chat space to send questions to the speaker. Um, if you hover towards the bottom of your screen, you will see a little chat bubble, and if you click on that, that's how you can access the chat space. Um, if you're having any problems connecting, you can also um, add those questions. If you can't hear, um, add a sort of inquiry in the chat space, and we'll try to get that addressed. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat space as questions come up during the presentation, and we will pose those to the speaker at the end. Um, today's program is supporting communities before and after disaster, and we're gonna be hearing from the Illinois Public Works Mutual Aid Network, as well as Extension's Disaster Education Network. Um, just as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be made, and it'll be available on our local government education website, as well as our YouTube channel. Um, our presenters for today are Ed Markinson, who is the president of the Illinois Public uh, Works Mutual Aid Network, and also the McHenry County Maintenance Superintendent and Carrie McKillop, who is Chair-Elect of the Extension Disaster Education Network, and also a University of Illinois Extension Community and Economic Development Educator. Um, just a little bit more background, Ed Markison is the Maintenance Superintendent for McHenry County Division of Transportation. He's responsible for the maintenance and repair of over 525 lane miles of county roadway. Uh, McHenry County joined IPWMAN in 2011, since that time, Mr. Markison has served as a regional director, vice president, and is now the current president of the organization. IPWMAN was incorporated in 2009 to provide a formal process for public work agencies to request and offer assistance during times of need. Um, from a membership of three agencies, IPWMAN has grown to over 370 member agencies, providing over 1.5 million in assistance to its members in the form of personnel, equipment and resources. Um, Carrie McKillop serves Henderson, Knock, Knox, uh, McDonough, and Warren counties as the U of I Extension Community and Economic Development Educator and has been working with community groups, counties, and local officials um, in, on disaster planning, education, and recovery ever since the floods of the 2008 um, Mississippi River incident. Um, she has assisted communities with natural hazard mitigation planning, as well as COAD development, which are community organizations active in disasters. McKillop also serves as a member of the Illinois VOAD um, organization, which is volunteer, voluntary organizations um, active in disasters. So we're very pleased to have both these speakers today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed. Thank you, Zach. I, before I get started, I just want to um, thank the Illinois Extension, in particular, uh, Nancy Wade-Drago. Um, I met Nancy last October at the IPW MAN conference. Uh, she did a presentation on resources, action items, and tips for preparedness. And during her presentation, I didn't realize that the Illinois Extension is available or located in all 102 counties. And immediately I uh, started thinking because when I took uh, over as president a year and a half ago, my big push was to try and market us, uh, always having Homeland Security in my background about being prepared that we need to do a better job in Illinois and get more people on board with this program. Uh, I'd just like to add for those of you that don't know where McHenry County is, to give you somewhat of a idea. Um, we're right on the Wisconsin border. Uh, we're one county in from Lake Michigan. Uh, back in 2009, when I first learned about this IPW MAN program, I went to their conference and uh, it was at the IEMA conference. And uh, what I also learned was, was that uh, I learned a lot about the state of Illinois. Um, for all the bad things that we always hear or see in, in the media, the state of Illinois is actually a, a, one of the leaders in the nation when it comes to mutual aid. So uh, it's been around quite a while since the 1960s. So with that, I've been pushing ever since. Um, our mission statement, it's the mission of Illinois Public Works Mutual Aid Network. 
in the spirit of intergovernmental cooperation to develop and maintain a statewide network of public works related agencies whose principal purpose is to provide mutual aid response and recovery assistance to each other when confronted with natural or man-made emergencies and disasters. Uh, the two biggest things out of this mission statement, I think, is the words develop and maintain. Um, we need to develop the preparedness and then maintain it. Uh, we're looking for help um, from, from being able to use the Illinois Extension community to be the conduit and help with the attempt to have all communities be prepared by becoming an IPAMAN member in the state of Illinois. Why statewide public works mutual aid? By definition, uh, disasters are typically beyond our capability to handle without outside assistance. Um, there's always the misconception people have that it won't happen to me, it won't happen here. Most disasters will also affect our neighboring communities. As a first responder, Public Works will be involved in the disaster from the beginning of the response until the end of the recovery. Public Works manpower is limited and local resources run out quickly. Therefore, mutual aid is needed earlier in an incident. Um, and then again, uh, some public works agencies, if you're an affected public works agency, you might have your own workers that are having their own personal problems. Maybe they have a tree on their house or something like that. So um, it's good to have the ability to uh, reach out to other public works agencies. Public works must be self-sufficient. They don't always have the required resources to adequately we respond. You pretty much need to be able to handle yourself for the first 72 hours. Other first responders have systems already in place. In public works, what's cool about it is we all do essentially the same job. So we all know the process and we can, we can assist one another with very early, easily in a very short period of time. Uh, this statement is pretty, it's a matter of it's, of it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. Once again, there's that misconception that it, it won't happen to us. Well, if it does happen to you and you are a member of uh, IPW Man, you have 370 plus members uh, that have your back. A little bit about on the history. The camel that broke the, uh, this is what broke the camel's back. 9-11, uh, everybody knows that. And then Hurricane Katrina. Um, in 2003, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5 established the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, and the Incident Command Systems. Uh, IPW MAN has incorporated NIMS program into our framework. The good thing about NIMS is that it works the same all the time, whether you're dealing with a parade or with a big windstorm. And then along came in 2005, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 8, which expanded the definition of first responders to be public works personnel. It was around 2006, a major ice storm hit Macon County. Uh, multiple public works agencies assisted. A federal disaster is declared uh, with all, uh, without an with all those public works agencies that assisted with the disaster, um, they did it without an agreement in place. In 2007, uh, IEMA, or the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, uh, finally put a stop to it and said enough's enough. Um, they make a last time exception to allow reimbursement to the assistant agencies that did not have signed written mutual aid agreements. So then other, there were several other local agencies within the state that started developing and looking to intergovernmental agreements within regions of the state. 
Tammy Bennett was a main player with uh, assisting getting IPW man on its feet. Uh, she's an engineering consultant from Tuscola. Began working with several groups within the state and received the initial backing from the Illinois section of the American Water Works Association to develop a statewide mutual aid organization. She worked very closely with other uh, mutual aid networks, in particular uh, the Illinois Law Enforcement Alarm System, or ALEAS, and the Mutual Aid Box Alarm System, um, MABIS, which is with fire departments, and they're, they're the granddaddies that have been around for since the 1960s. And also with the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, also known as IEMA, and the Illinois Terrorism Task Force. Offered support and experience as IPW Man developed the framework for its organization. In 2008, an intern board of directors was elected to create the organization. 2009, IPW Man was officially incorporated by law. They had three member agencies initially uh, Stevenson County, Village of Wakanda, and the city of Urbana. Later, in May of that same year, IPW Man responded to its first request for assistance in Carterville, Illinois, to assist with cleanup following damaging straight line winds. I remember the, this storm uh, directly because I remember looking at, at, the, at Southern Illinois and it was described as an inland hurricane, but also I'd ne never seen purple in the in the color of the uh, radar before. So I, I knew something bad wasn't going on good down there. Also, it was SIU's uh, graduation. Um, since 2009, membership has grown from three agencies to over 370, as Zach stated earlier. IPW Man represents the public works community is a member of the Illinois Terrorism Task Force, State Emergency Operations, and other mutual aid organizations. IPW Man has also joined into memoranda of understanding with MABUS, ILEAS, IEMA, and we're currently working with the Illinois Emergency Services Association, also known as IESMA, uh, to have an MO with you with them which provides implement members with access to additional resources when recovering from emergencies or disasters. So we're trying to peddle ourselves out there to get in, uh, more IPW man members so that those members have the same resources that we're able to, to put out there from other public works agencies. But we're, IPW man also has the ability to uh, get additional resources from these other groups, Mavis, Ilea, Saima, and Iasma. IPW Man has responded to requests for assistance resulting from all kinds of different things, including flooding, tornadoes, wind damage, equipment failure, etc. each year. <clears throat> the statewide mutual aid system for public works agencies in, that, in Illinois. Uh, if all mem uh, any member can be, they can be from public works, they can be from townships, highway departments, water and waste of water agencies, park districts, or just any public agency perform that performs public works. Our organization is set up with 21 officers. Uh, we meet quarterly at different locations throughout the sa state. To try and make it fair for everybody to uh, have to travel as least as possible. Uh, we consist of the pre president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, media, past president, and 16 regional directors. This is just the list of our executive board and contact information. And this is a really cool uh, slide in that, uh, we have two board of directors from each region. And our region is, regional map is why I create something new is exactly like IEMA's. And to top all that off, we've started uh, going and attending uh, IEMA's quarterly meetings also with the uh, directors in the uh, 
adjacent uh, regions. Some of the benefits of IPW MAN, all public works related agencies can be members. Membership sets priorities and control system. Network maintains current readily accessible listing of resources. We're recognized by AEMA and other statewide mutual aid organizations. We hold us. We ho actually hold a seat at the uh, state's EOC center. Um, comprehensive public works driven and led training. Access to assets from all corner of Illinois. Uh, the first five days support is at no cost. Uh, and what's cool about that is uh, m members don't have an issue whatsoever to come to go and help somebody in the hopes that should they ever be a stricken member that you would go and help them in return. Um, standardized operating procedures, uh, quick and direct access to assets, and one agreement uh, simplif with simplified reimbursement this one agreement is a shared agreement with, as was stated earlier, over 370 members. A little bit about response, what we can go for. Uh, essentially any kind of natural or man-made hazard. Um, you see earthquakes is listed there. Uh, we have that New Madrid fault line, central, southern Illinois and we're really lacking in any kind of coverage down there for membership, so we could use some assistance there. Uh, examples of mutual aid that can be provided is materials, equipment, various types of teams, public, even a public administration assistance. Since 2009, when the organization was formed, we have given, performed over $2 million of mutual aid to stricken members. If you're a member and need assistance, uh, this is kind of a general guide at how it happens. First, you need to assess your needs, and then you would call uh, our 24-hour call center. Uh, it's actually called CECOM, and it's noted, it's located, uh, CECOM is uh, Southeast Emergency Communications and it's based out of Crystal Lake, Illinois. And then uh, CECOM would uh, contact uh, one of our duty officers or resource coordinators. We have two on, on duty each month. And then the resource co coordinator would then reach back to you to see what your needs are. And once he knows what the needs are, then he would work again with CECOM and CECOM would put a, a mass email notification or text uh, to either all of the state or just certain regions that there might be a request for. And you'll constantly work with that uh, resource, resource uh, sorry about that, coordinator throughout the event. This is just a list of uh, some of our responses to date. Um, we've had 34 requests since 2009. Um, this very, I, I'm not gonna touch on each one of them, but the very first one is one of them that I'd like to say a few things about. Uh, we were deployed as a state asset where reimbursement was involved. Uh, this isn't likely to happen very often, and as a matter of fact, I don't think we've been uh, deployed since then as a state asset. And um, in a state, uh, there's a, even if there's a, you're trying to get a presidential di directive, I believe it's $18 million is the current threshold. So um, it's really hard to meet that threshold. Um, on May 17, 2009, Six different agencies responded. Um, we currently had 18 members by May. Remember we started with three, but we had 18. Six responded. Uh, just because you're a member uh, doesn't mean that you automatically have to respond. Um, it, you got your own things to do. So, But uh, these six, which were located 
uh, from central Illinois to northern Illinois and needed to all go south. South. It was Stevenson County, um, um, Village of Wakanda, Village of Villa Park, City of Macomb, City of Champaign, and City of Urbana. They all met in Champaign. Uh, there was 24 personnel in all, 14 dumps, a wheel loader, skid stir, brush chipper, field truck, grapple truck, and a low boy semi. They then all convo convoyed their way down south and over the next five days removed 8,000 cubic yards of debris in Carterville, saving them over $100,000. We had some mix. Uh, these are just some of the other responses that we attended. As I stated, I wasn't going to go through each one of them. But each year you see that something, something comes up. Uh, mostly flooding or storms. Uh, In 15 and 16, the one I want to point out here is the June 24th, uh, the aid to Coal City. Um, Coal City actually previously, a few years before that, had got hit with a tornado. Remember that people, it'll never happen here, thought, or whatever, but it was just a few years prior to that, they got hit with a tornado. There was a request for us to offer some assistance, but we couldn't do it because they weren't a member, and then you run into all kinds of liability issues. Um, so they did become a member after that initial tornado. Well, then they got hit with a really big one, um, and then over 40 of our members went and assisted them. In 2017, those are the most recent tornadoes. Um, Nat Plate in Ottawa. Uh, over 22 agencies assisted each one of these communities uh, with a savings to Ottawa of $150,000 and Nat Plate of $350,000. And then in 2018, uh, my county was actually hit in September, late September, with some high winds. And four communities, Cary, Algonquin, Lake in the Hills, and the village of Huntley were all hit pretty severely. And we had 20 plus members um, offer their support. And within five days, we had all those communities pick, cleaned up. And it just hit at a bad time. I mean, there was leaf pickup going on, brush pickup. They were getting starting to prepare for winter operations. And they said if they would have had to clean them up themselves, it would have been at least uh, two and a half to three months for each one of those communities. So this, this is a really great program and it's a cheap, very cheap form of insurance. Some of the, our highlights, uh, authority is provided under Illinois law. One standard agreement signed by each member agency. Um, that's the cool thing. Uh, with that agreement, we didn't go out and recreate the wheel. Um, we reached out to uh, Mavis and Ileas, and we all, if you look at it, all three of these agreements, they look essentially about the same. Um, I know when I tried getting it through, uh, through my, my particular county that the state's attorneys wanted to change some of the wording. You, there is no changing the wording in, in our agreement. Either you uh, sign it or you don't sign it. So uh, it's self-renewing after the first year with payment of dues. You can cancel at any time. 12-hour um, minimum response guarantee. Can recall resources at any time after the first 12 hours. Uh, you, you may see a reimbursement after five days. We're not exclusive. Uh, any public agency can join. Um, by, by joining IPW, Man, you open your community up to an abundance of resources, equipping, equipping yourself with the right tool at the right time. Here's just a graph of our, uh, showing our membership, what types of uh, 
membership we have on that much on the water agency, but mainly all township, county, and villages. Um, as you can see here, uh, it's all broke down some more. Um, the one thing I'd like to point out is the counties, uh, 38 of them. Um, we got 102 of them. Uh, at the very least, I, you know, one of my goals would be to, to at least see all the counties. And here's a uh, color map. Uh, the purple air colored areas are the, are the current members that are counties. Um, and then you look down in southern Illinois down there and you don't see that we, we don't have much coverage whatsoever. So whatever help uh, getting the word out to uh, communities would be greatly appreciated. How much does it cost and what do, what's that money go for? Well, the money goes for we, uh, our 24-hour uh, dispatch center, our website maintenance, uh, maintenance of resource lists, insurance for uh, board members, uh, and contracted administrative support. Um, we do have somebody that we do pay that uh, is helping us a little bit now that we're getting bigger. And a portion of it goes to our annual conference. Um, the fees are based on population. If you're under 15,000, it's $100 per year. 15 to 75,000, $250 a year. And over 75,000, it's $500 a year. Uh, this cost can be less than renting a piece of equipment for a day. One won't find a cheaper insurance policy. A few reminders, no community is too large or too small to need help in a disaster. No community is too small to help. If you can spare one truck and one person, you can help. Um, I did a lot of pedaling. We got a lot of members just within my own county. I believe 16 of the 17 townships are all members. And a few of those townships are, they just got one, one worker. And that's essentially the road district commissioner. And he's like, why would I? He goes, I'm not going to be able to go help anybody. But, you know, it's like, why would you not want to protect your township and have the ability to have, well, what it is now, three, you know, 300 and other, 370 other members' resources. And you do have that ability. When disasters strike, assistance may not be available locally or regionally. It may, it you know, we all have prior to this network going up is we, we had agreements just within our own county where, you know, we could offer assistance to one another. Uh, the tricky thing with that was each agreement was different. So it's tough for anybody to know what each agreement is. So um, it's good to be able to have this uh, network and like the windstorms that came into my county last year and the, the communities outside our county are the ones that all came and assisted those, those towns. And IPW Man is the first organization of its kind in the United States. Yes and no. Uh, there are a few states that do have uh, similar uh, networks. Uh, New Hampshire, uh, California, I, and Utah are some of them that I know, but what's unique about our network is ours is all ran by uh, public works people. Um, and those other communities are either ran by the state or somebody else. So uh, it's, it's rather unique in that, that take. How can I become a member? Please just visit our website. Uh, there's all kinds of information there. Uh, Download the checklist, the agreement, the emergency contact list. All of it's all of it's in there. There's frequently asked questions. Uh, if you know of somebody that's an IPW man member, just let them know, and they can help assist you. Um, complete the checklist and the agreement and ordinance, and have approved by governing authority. By signing the agreement, you have to remember 
now 370 members have your back. Send those documents back in a, with a check to IPW Man. Once your agency is accepted, complete the uh, contact information. We'll ask for uh, uh, the organization looks to hopefully get at least uh, three contacts. As I stated earlier, some townships might only have one contact, but that's what it is. Here's just a shot of our uh, of our uh, website page. And if you see up here at the top, there's a member section. Just click up there and everybody that's listening, if you get an opportunity, uh, go to your particular area, your county, and uh, see if your community is uh, is a member or not. And if not, please please let them know about this program. And with that, uh, that's all I've got to say for right now. That was great information, Ed. Thank you so much. Um, again, if folks have questions, feel free to use the chat space. You can access the chat bubble if you have, don't have the window up already um, by hovering at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and type your questions in there and we'll hold those till the end after we hear from our second speaker. Um, so at this time, we are going to turn it over to Carrie McKillop, who's going to talk a little bit about the Extension Disaster Education Network. Hopefully, you can now see my screen. Hello? We can, yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> just wanted to make sure. We had a little technical difficulty um, yesterday, so just wanted to, to double check. And I am Carrie McKillop. Um, I'm the Community Development Educator in Henderson, Knox, Warren, uh, and McDonough counties in West Central Illinois. And as Zach mentioned in the introduction, I sort of got um, thrown into disaster um, programming along the floods of uh, 2008. Um, for those of you who are not from this area, Henderson County is our county that has direct uh, um, Mississippi Riverfront uh, excitement this time of year as, as um, our participants from Henderson County can tell you. And I got involved in the organization um, that we call EDEN. And EDEN, as you can see from the screen, is actually the Extension Disaster Education Network. And to, to really understand all the services and such that come through EDEN, to know a little bit about the history it was actually formed by Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri after the floods of 1993. Um, many of the extension personnel who were serving along the Mississippi River and on our campuses um, wanted to be able to better coordinate some of the services, education, and information we were providing to um, communities that were affected by those floods. I assume most of us remember um, the flooding of 1993, those of us who are old enough to remember that. Um, I personally lived in Terre Haute, Indiana at that time, and it still um, made the national news. I remember the pictures of the floods in Alton coming up um, on the elevators that were on the riverfront at that time. So the, the leaders in Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri applied for a USDA grant, which is where most of Extension's federal funding comes from. And they awarded that grant to the North Central Region, which is one of the ways we uh, break up the Cooperative Extension Service in, in the United States. And they came up with the name of Eden, um, just to have something quick and easy instead of having to say the Extension Disaster Education Network every time um, uh, we talked about the organization. Um, and in 1997, it moved out of the North Central region and became a national program and, and started signing on all of the land grant institutions that host cooperative extension services, including um, all 50 states and three territories. We actually have Eden members in Guam, in uh, Puerto Rico, and in the Virgin Islands. 
Um, we also have affiliate members internationally. But after we started going national, um, it became clear that we needed a little administrative support, as Ed mentioned, with, with uh, their organization. You get so large, you have to have some administrative support. And so the um, what's now known as NIFA, CREES, um, general support and training grant was awarded to the organization and it became administered through Purdue, Purdue University in Indiana, which is the land grant in Indiana. And um, it began uh, becoming much more formalized, began linking with federal, state, and local agencies throughout the U.S. Um, so really, the mission of Eden is not response. Many of you, and, and it's great that that um, we're talking about response, but what we're really um, talking about with Eden is education uh, before, during, and after um, disasters and also mitigating those disasters. So, so it, we don't actually do the response side. There may be individual extension employees that get involved with response, but that's really not what Eden's mission is. It's, it's to be the preparatory and planning phases and providing um, timely information and best practices and research-based information to those dealing with disasters on the ground, including participatory planning. Um, so we also have the ability to get information from other states when necessary. Um, one example of that is being able to um, send a request out to all of our de delegates across the United States to look for specific information. Um, one of the things that comes to mind when we had those uh, February 29th tornadoes, one of them hitting Harrisburg here in Illinois, but in southern Missouri, they were looking for information on how to clean up insulation out of pastures um, for horses. And so that was something that we were able to access from other states and, and get to them in a timely manner. So some of those unique situations that you wouldn't necessarily think about um, and providing that information in a timely manner. Um, our, our real external goals are working for those of you, most of you on the, the phone today, is to try to enhance the ability of your citizens, families, communities, agencies, and businesses to, to make sure that they're prepared for all phases of the disaster. And we actually serve as a national resource clearinghouse. I don't know why my slide keeps advancing without me advancing it. Um, but we also keep a library and links to the most recent research-based disaster education. Um, so we can um, access that at any time. Um, working through the disaster phases and we have programming um, to deal with almost all of the aspects of the disaster phases. As I mentioned, we have the 1862, which is what most people think of as land-grant institutions, but also um, the 1890 institutions. We have 14 of the 19 um, 1890 institutions as members. For those of you unfamiliar with that terminology, those are historically black colleges um, that were given land-grant status in the 1890s. We are also trying to reach out to 1994 institutions, which are the Native American serving um, institutions, and so that's one of our goals in the years to come. For those of you along Lake Michigan, we also have a liaison with Sea Grants and partnerships with Sea Grants. Um, Susan Lovelace is our NOAA Sea Grant liaison. We also have regular participation from NIFA. Um, Beverly Samuel is our liaison and um, hopefully works to strengthen our network and provide the education that, that our communities need. And we also um, have representation from the Extension um, Community of Practice, which are the national directors of Extension. Um, and Nick Place from Florida is our current ECOP. 
but we are a network of educators, researchers, and scientists, and we all volunteer our time to be part of the Extension Disaster Education Network. Um, we have over 75 different areas of expertise, and we're expanding that all the time as we're bringing on new delegates and new members. And so almost any need in our local communities that has an educational component or a planning component, we can access um, to help those of you working um, in disasters. As you can see by this slide, some of you may find this all too familiar. Um, we recognize that all disasters are local and extension is local as well. Even though I've been talking about our national partnerships, most of us work in the field and in your communities. Um, so we can assist in a large number of um, areas and programs. So I encourage you to talk to your local extension office um, contacting the county director if you're not familiar with the educators in the field. Um, we can assist in lots of different areas. The first here is um, strengthening community agri-security. For those of you from rural counties, this has been a large initiative of Eden um, throughout its history simply because the funding that um, that uh, supports Eden is from the Food and Agricultural Defense Initiative Fund. And uh, so agri-security preparedness and, and making sure the safety of our food supply is one of the primary goals. And we do have programs on that. If you have a large agriculture sector in your community, we're more than willing to um, assist you in getting information regarding that program. We also have many uh, family life and, and family preparedness programs. We have a family preparedness program that works through for uh, families what they should do to be prepared for any kind of disaster that might hit in their area. Um, we also have a family financial toolkit that can be used with families in the event a disaster does occur and people need to work through some of those um, items after a disaster. So we do have access to all of those, and those are research-based programs. Ready Business is one of the programs that we offer throughout the state of Illinois on a regular basis, and it is basically developing a continuity of operations plan for small businesses. If you have small businesses in your community that are at risk for flooding, um, tornado, and all of them are at risk for fire and some of those things. They really should have a continuity of operation plan. Please contact your local extension office. Um, if they don't have someone in that unit um, trained, there are many of us that are more than willing to travel, um, come help them uh, develop those, those plans. I'm trying to talk really fast. Um, we also have an on guard program which is protect specifically food safety and protecting um, food supply that can be offered in your area. Also, the animal agri security course. This is currently being updated along with Ready Business, um, and so we can um, find people and bring people in from other states um, if necessary to help you uh, develop your ag agri security plan. And we also offer community planning. Some of the things that we've worked on in recent years including, include um, helping you develop a community organization active in disasters um, or group, which is there to assist your emergency managers um, in all aspects of recovery. Uh, many times it's grown out of the long-term recovery committee and um, backs up to help with volunteer management. Um, lots of different ancillary activities to the response, basically to help local officials and first responders not have to worry about those types of activities such as shelter, uh, volunteer management, setting up a multiple agency resource center, all of those things that might happen in the event of a disaster. And if you don't have a co-op or a co-ed in your community, um, feel free to contact 
us and we'll be glad to assist you in, in trying to figure out how to get that started. We can also work with existing co-eds and help get their plans a little more structured so that um, in the time of, of operationalizing those, those committees, um, they can function outside of the disaster zone and pick up some of those um, activities that need to happen while the response is still going on. We do have some other courses. As you can see, this says 2010 edition. Um, this year, our Ag and Natural Resources Committee of Eden is updating this curriculum as well. So we would have plant biosecurity. Um, some of you on the phone call might recognize this. This is a photo that I got from the former um, Henderson County uh, Emergency manager, I saw Cindy was on the phone now, but Coral Sites was the emergency manager at the time of the flood. And this is one of those lovely pictures that really brings home to most of us that disasters really are local. And hopefully we will never see this sign, which is back up on US 34, um, uh, this far underwater again, but if we do, it is nice to know that not only our communities and families are com are prepared, but everyone is prepared and, and knows how to get to the other side of a disaster and survive. I would encourage you to contact your local extension office. If you don't know who to contact, contact Nancy, Zach, myself, any of us are more than willing um, to try to put you in touch with someone who can help you um, establish any of these programs in your community. Um, preparedness, as we know, is always the key. Um, staying in contact, making sure that everyone is aware of what programs and resources are out there. And um, I think Ed's presentation was very timely, as I know um, we're getting almost daily emails on on river stages along the Mississippi. So um, hopefully everyone will get through this spring without many disasters, but we know eventually it will happen in all our communities. And since we at Extension live in our communities, we wanna make sure you know that we're here to help. As I said, I am located, my office is in Galesburg, Illinois. I'm in West Central Illinois. I'm willing to help out in other areas as need, but, uh, um, we have staff all over the state that are more than willing to um, assist you as well. Excellent. Well, I think um, both of these uh, resources are wonderful for communities, and I thank both Ed and Carrie for sharing with us. Um, we do have time for questions now. Um, again, feel free to type those in the chat space. Um, looks like Nancy has uh, put a couple in there to get us started. Um, and I think these are for the IPW MAN um, organization. And she, she talks about, I love seeing the timeline of impact from I, IPW MAN, and sort of the response they've made. How would you characterize that turnout action and how are you pushing out these type of rapid response from so many different members and entities? I guess that's a question for Ed. Uh, everybody that's a member it seems like we all have a passion to help one another. So that's never an issue with uh, uh, getting this pushed out and getting responses. And once again, that's done through um, their dispatch through CECOM. And I mean, we all get to see the uh, text and emails that go out when somebody is in distress and needs help. Excellent. So you kind of just touched on this, but a follow-up question is, um, she said, I saw you mention the dispatch center. What does this exactly entail, and does it run with CADs in different regions? What do you mean by CADs? Nancy, would you like to unmute yourself? And Computer automated dispatch systems. Oh, well, that, that this is a regular, it's like a uh, regular radio room, like uh, sheriff's radio, uh, police radio, uh, dispatch center. So they have all that uh, latest and greatest technology that they work with in, in order to make this happen. Okay, and then one more question. 
for you. What sorts of partnerships have you experienced during recovery efforts and what partnerships do you hope for in the future? Um, all kinds of partnerships with uh, just uh, the networking that takes place when you go to assist somebody. Um, a lot with the fire department. Um, that's what forced us to, you know, move forward. We, we've always had an MOU uh, with uh, uh, IEMA, but that was the only one we had. So now within Illinois Terrorism Task Force, I believe. But uh, uh, now we've got one with Mavis and Ilias, and that's just through uh, going to some of these uh, disasters and getting to know certain people. And now um, we have the ability in the future to be able to utilize their resources or them use our resources. Uh, a lot of times, the, the one example that came up was uh, fire department. Um, they, they were asked, why don't you utilize public works to help you unload the timber that they use to help support walls that are in danger of falling down during a fire or whatever is how do you how do you load and unload that well we do it with the personnel well public works has all the toys that can do that a lot quicker for them and not break their backs so that's that's just an example of some of the things that have taken place in the future we want to continue to expand and um i guess more than anything, the expansion is to get 100% coverage throughout the state of Illinois and then possibly work on uh, putting something together that we could have a program and be able to go across state lines like my county. Uh, there's quite a, been a, quite a few times in the past where uh, Wisconsin counties that were adjacent to, uh, we can't go help them unless you know they uh, do a state thing state to state thing or whatever but uh try try and make it easier make uh uh just more efficient great um so i guess i'll ask a follow-up question um for carrie so you mentioned the um, community organizations active in disasters and then also the volunteer organizations active in disasters Can yes you just expand upon those a little bit and talk about what the benefits of forming one of those might be certainly well um Currently, volunteer organizations active in disaster are sort of the state, and, and we're moving more towards that. We're, we're moving to the statewide organizations. That's where you'll find Red Cross, Salvation Army, um, those types of organizations that sort of branch out all over the state. Whereas community organizations active in disaster are more locally based. Um, many of them are county or, or by county. Um, organizations and if you don't have one and there's not a lot of them currently in Illinois as I mentioned we do have one in Henderson County um, and a colleague and I are, are working with the Quad Cities on getting some more uh, formal plans in place for theirs but if you don't have one there's some some pretty easy guidance especially in rural counties to help get one developed and they really are a support network for the emergency managers what you'll find is is when when my colleague and i started working with the one in the quad cities the scott county iowa emergency manager was the uh, uh chair of it which sort of defeats the purpose because the coad should be a support system for the emergency management function. And what they do are things like emergency shelter, donations, volunteer coordination. Um, there's uh, faith-based committees um, in the Quad Cities. We're working to develop an animal support uh, committee. So they're doing the things to support the recovery and response efforts going on in the ground and hopefully take some headache out of the realm of the emergency manager. And most of those um, committees and functions have developed as, as most of our emergency management knowledge has out of um, what happened after 9-11 and Katrina, knowing um, in hindsight what we need to do better. Um, and so they're really just support organizations um, that people get together, have plans in place. They support the NIMS and the ICS functions um, so that people 
are not stepping on people's toes in a disaster scenario. Awesome. So it looks like we have one more question. But in the meantime, um, on the screen, you will see a poll question. Um, you can respond, please, by clicking directly on the screen. Um, that'll help us sort of gauge the, the level of learning that occurred today. I um, appreciate that. And then the sort of final question before we wrap up is for Carrie and Ed both. What should officials do as first steps in reaching out to IPW Man and Eden? What information do they need to provide? And where along the checklist and preparedness should they reach out? I could go first and just say, hello? Go ahead, Ed. OK. Um, yeah, no, I'll just reach out to our website. Uh, it's, it's pretty defined out there. Um, it, there will be just a few questions that need to be filled out. And then uh, based off your population, um, and depending if, if you have, need an ordinance or resolution to pass first, uh, that information just all gets sent back to IPW Man, along with a check based off your population size. And, and then shortly after that, we'd be co contacting you for uh, contact information. And, and in terms of contacting your local extension, office to see what they can assist you with. I, if you do not already maintain regular contact with your local extension office, I would encourage you to call them, um, ask to speak to the county director. Um, if they do not have um, staff in the county that, that work in this realm, I'm sure they'll be glad to, to reach out to some of us who do and we'll try to get you hooked up with assistance um, through, through the state. But um, it, it really, any time non-disaster is when you should be reaching out because in the middle of a disaster, as we all know, it's much more difficult. So on blue sky days, call your extension office. We'd love to be out and uh, see what we can do to assist you. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you both again for providing this, one, this great information that, that will be um, probably very indispensable for communities should they the unfortunate situation of facing a disaster. Um, I'd like to thank all the people who participated in today's webinar and listened in. As a reminder, a video recording of today's webinar will be available on the local government education website within two to three business days. And then I hope you'll all be able to join us for um, the next webinar, which occurs um, two Thursdays from now on Thursday, April 18th at noon. And the webinar is entitled, Our Demographics Destiny for the Rural Midwest economic development implications of rural youth population decline for our region. And our presenter is going to be Dr. Christopher Merritt um, from the Illinois Institute of Rural Affairs at Western Illinois University. So I hope to see a lot of you um, participating in that upcoming webinar. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.